I'm Cadet Captain James Burke, the 2017 Cadet Training Group Superintendent, and I'm going to be talking to you today about intensity, specifically how we use intensity at encampment. To start out, I want to give you a dictionary definition of intensity. The Merriam-Webster's uh, Dictionary explains intensity as intensity is existing in, extre in an extreme degree and also having or showing a characteristic in an extreme degree. And then finally, exhibiting strong feeling or earnestness of purpose. Now from this and our understanding of intensity and encampment, we have generated a definition uh, that we will use going forward for intensity. Intensity is a measurable amount of stress applied to an individual or group to aid in producing a desired product. Two things I want you to notice from these definitions. First, the Merriam-Webster definition, there was the reference to uh, intensity being in relationship to extreme degree, uh, that idea of degrees of intensity. I want you to remember that and also that it is for, the per for, is for a specific purpose. Intensity is directed at a purpose to produce a product in our example. I'm going to be talking about three things throughout the course of this video. We're going to talk first about lenses, how we view intensity, specifically how it affects the human. Second, we're going to be talking about tools that you that I'm going to give you to use at, in, at encampment to produce intensity. And finally, we're going to talk about things not to do, things to avoid uh, that are not healthy practices. I hope you enjoy this video. So now I'm going to talk to you and explain the yorks dotson curve. Uh, it's a theory on how humans respond to stress applied to them in specific situations. You can find this in the encampment training manual, figure 4.1, page 29 as a reference. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. So the yorks dotson curve we see consists of different components. On the y-axis we see performance. The higher you rise on the y-axis, the greater performance you see, the lower the less performance. On the x-axis we see uh, the words asleep, arousal, and terrified. These refer to the amount of stress applied to the individual. As more stress is applied, we see the individual going into a more aroused state, uh, which we could call also a more stressed state where they are at their optimal performance level, which is what we desire. It must be understood that there is a law of diminishing returns that after a certain amount of uh, stress is applied, performance decreases. This can be induced by excessive yelling or the perception of feeling terrified. Also, likewise, an individual can fall into being asleep by excessive yelling. So now I'm gonna be talking to you about the effective training box. And this is a lens that we use to look through at the training we provide to the students. Uh, it is tied to the yerkes dotson curve and has elements that are related, relatable. The idea was developed by Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Pixley and was given to the CTG two years ago at the 2015 encampment. And so we're gonna go ahead and take a look at that right now. So looking at the effective training box, we see that on the left and right hand side are two lines that both refer to the rules and regulations of encampment and our training environment that we're setting. In the, within these rules and regulations are also enclosed the uh, training objectives of what we're trying to accomplish at encampment. These are hard lines, black and white lines that are held. Now at the top, we have what an individual can handle, and at the bottom we have what an individual needs as a bare minimum to be able to perform. Within the box is an area that we want you to train in and we want you to color all in that area, wherever you want inside that area, within regulation and within what an individual can handle. We're not in kindergarten, so I'm gonna trust that you, we all know how to color within the lines. Color to the full extent of what the box allows. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the actual tools that I'm gonna to give you. Um, to start out, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I work as an apprentice electrician 
uh, and I've been doing this for over the last year. And so my trade uh, requires me to be proficient working with different tools. And so because I'm used to working with different tools, I'm gonna be using tools as our analogy for the different aspects uh, that you'll be uh, using. So to start out, you have to have the right tool for the right situation, period. You can't go and paint a house with channel locks. It's impossible. Uh, it just won't work. And so what does this require? It requires you to have a full toolbox. You have to be able to, have a, to, be able to do uh, all the things that you need to do. And also, you have to have the right way of using the right tool. Uh, it's not just having a, the right tool, having that paintbrush, but you have to know how to actually use that paintbrush. Something that I have learned working with tools a lot, working with different materials and metal and things like that, is as you're working on it, you're trying to get something to work to fit. Um, if you don't know your tool, and you don't know that material you're working with, you're more than likely going to break what you're working with if you're trying to force it, you're trying to make it happen. And so what's really important at Encampment is that we not only have the tools, but we know how to use them properly in the right situations and not take it to that point where we break what we're working with. Meaning, on that Yerkes Dotson curve, taking someone to being terrified or falling asleep, losing it, dropping. Uh, we want to be able to hold on to these things, be able to work on it, do what we need to do, accomplish our mission. So the first tool is presence. The presence, how you carry yourself. I'm representing this with a pair of channel locks um, and they can be adjusted. So with each of these, we're gonna look at them through the lens of a dial. They all have dials. There's a, a certain level of intensity that you can use in presence, greater intensity and less. So with this, for the less intensity, examples of presence, how you carry yourself, where the dial is maybe turned down uh, to the lower end of you, how you're carrying your presence. Uh, examples of this would be um, things like sitting at the back of a classroom during a class and taking notes of the class. Your students see this, they recognize it, and they see this person is intent on what's happening, I should do so. Wearing the uniform properly, and even silently standing and observing is, the, is another way of using presence turned to a lower degree. Now turn to a higher degree would be such things as more uh, walking quickly to illustrate the need for uh, speed, that things need to be done fast. And I would even put turning in the upper category of eye contact as a more intimate, direct way of having that presence and that bearing of putting yourself into these situations and carrying yourself strongly. The next area we're gonna be talking about is volume. And volume, I'm going to represent with the use of a paintbrush. In the same way with presence, that it can be turned up and down, volume can be turned up and down. You can go with a heavy stroke and be loud. You can go with a soft stroke and be quiet. Or there can be no stroke, and there's silence. Now when you're, uh, let's say you're painting a picture, an artist is painting a picture, sometimes he uses heavy strokes to make uh, some type of emphasis on something, other times he uses light strokes, and then sometimes he leaves an area that does not have strokes. This is the formula utilizing these three elements of loud, quiet, and silence within volume that you are going to use to effectively institute intensity and stressful situations. I want to free you to let you know that you are allowed to use volume. Volume does not equate to hazing. We're more worried about the content of what you're saying. And so because of that, there are absolutely many circumstances at, at encampment that require using increased volume. But this can't be the only tool we use. If it is the only tool we use, there are situations that can be uh, very detrimental to training. One, you lose your voice. You lose your only tool, you're out of that tool. The other is using one tool can push someone into being asleep or terrified. Next, we're gonna talk about expectations. And the, the tool that I'm using for this is the level. The level is a standard that stays the same. And you set it. You said, I want things to be level. And so 
this will be level. You set the standard and then you come back and you check that standard and you see where it stands. When you set intensity, and when you, excuse me, when you set expectations, they fall along the lines of this dial also. You set the dial higher, uh, you set higher expectations. When you set the dial lower, you set lower expectations. When you set these expectations, you have to realize that in the same way that if you set too high of expectations, you could, uh, that are unreachable, that are impossible, that the team can't reach. This can be a demotivating factor and not encourage high performance. Lastly, we're gonna talk about time, your fourth tool, which I have characterized as a measuring tape. A measuring tape is also a standard of measurement that remains the same as time is, but you can set it at different levels for how long or how short the task is. The measuring tape and the level both tie together closely as you are using expectations and time you set an expectation, and then you have to set the time requirement. They tie together. With time, you have to realize that you have to give enough time to be, for something to be completed, but not too much time that the situation no longer is stressful, is no longer intense with driving purpose because it's already been completed, it's over, it's done. So you have to be able to gauge these things. When you set time and expectations, these are both things that are set ahead of time before. You have this much time to complete this. An example though with time is on the first day, you tell the flight, I, you will fall in in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 5, 2, 1. When you go through and you do that, you're setting an unrealistic expectation for them on the first day. Now on the last day, should they be able to fall in in 10 seconds? A true 10 seconds? I think they probably should. But this is gonna be relevant to your situation for your students, for the intensity you're setting. Remember, with all of these tools, to have a full toolbox to utilize all of them will eliminate the possibility of turning someone to being terrified or asleep via only using one. As I said with volume as an example, if you only use volume, somebody's either gonna check out and they're gonna be done with this situation after you, they've heard so much of you yelling, and they'll go with sleep, or they'll become terrified and not be able to respond. With all of these, the tools are important. You have to use all of them, but you have to use them correctly. So now that we've talked about the tools that you will use and the lenses that you will look at the intensity levels and the things that we're providing to the students, we wanna consider the things that we will not be doing that are unacceptable or inefficient. These things include personal attacks, directly attacking someone's ability to make decisions or understand things, asking questions such as, why did you do this? Uh, or what were you thinking? Also in this area are things that are directly um, either mocking or uh, bringing unneeded attention to physical features uh, or differences in individuals that are outside of our training purposes. We will also not be encroaching on an individual's personal space. When you're inspecting someone, you will not approach closer than two to three feet away from them. You always maintain this distance around an individual, giving them their space. There will be no swearing or sarcasm acceptable for training our students. These are both unneeded and inefficient. There, you will not point when directing information and intensity in an individual, you will use their name, address them by their name. You will also not touch the students at any point during the week. Finally, you will not attack with a ruler. Rulers aren't swords, they're a tool to use. Even though we may not be, realize we're swinging them around and using them to gesture during an inspection, we have to realize that all we need is one inch. And to hold the ruler, as we're using one inch, with the remainder of the ruler coming down from the backside. Finally, I want you to really realize and think about that the reason why an individual may be making a mistake is because they weren't taught it correctly or they didn't understand what they were taught. So take personal responsibility for that and instruct again when somebody makes a mistake, when it's a repeated mistake. Take that personal responsibility. 
Now we're gonna be showing you some Marine Corps clips. And when you watch these clips, I want you to analyze out of the things I just said that we will not be doing and out of the effective ways to train that we have talked about, your Stotson Curve, the effective training box, the tools, out of all of those, what are effective and ineffective ways as far as our training goes that the Marine Corps does in this video that we should emulate or things that we will not be emulating. So take note on those things. Enjoy. So in summary, we talked about intensity being a means to an end, not an end in itself. We don't do intensity just to do intensity for the sake of intensity. We do it to produce a product to meet an objective. Next, we talked about the Yerkes Dodson and the effective training box and how both of those are lenses that we view the training that we are providing through for how it affects humans and the individuals, the students that we're working with. And then we talked about the tools that you will use, your toolbox. One being presence, two being your volume, three the expectations you set, and four the time constraints that you place. We talked about the things not to do, the things that will be unacceptable and inefficient for our training purposes. And then finally, we showed a clips of the Marine Corps uh, trainers at a uh, basic training for their um, purposes. And in that, we asked that you analyze the situations of the ways that they are using intensity for the ways that they're effective and the ways that they are ineffective. And for that, um, I just want to make a note to realize that we are not critiquing the Marine Corps on their specific uh, mission and the way they do things. The way they do things is perfect for their mission. We have a different mission from them. And so since we have a different mission, uh, some of the things they do are ineffective for, the, for our mission. And I want you to look at those things. And finally, I want to reiterate that the intense, intensity that you provide to students is understood by how it's perceived, not by how you think it's gonna come across. What you might think you're providing might be vastly different from what's actually coming across. Uh, a, an appropriate quote for this is, everything we do contributes to the perception that defines the experience. No matter what you do at encampment, there's gonna be a perception that comes across the intensity you provide. And that perception is the experience that the students have, how they perceive you. So if you have any questions about this video, anything that was included, please comment below. And I thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it.